you may remember that the last time I talked mostly about how one deals in the electron microscope with small objects, things that you can basically suspend in a drop of liquid and then just drop down onto, uh, onto a grid if the grid is properly prepared. What I want to do today is talk about what's become, of course, a major, major component of electron microscopy, which is the idea of how one cuts sections of tissues. Mostly I'm talking about biological material. And this is going to be, I'm afraid, pretty much a technical kind of, of almost an engineering talk. I'll try to introduce a few other bits to it, but there'll be a fair amount of getting into the weeds of the machines because I think it turns out to be something important for the general understanding of, of how this field developed. And I wanna capture, if I can, something of the enthusiasm of these people who were in the, I guess it was the 1950s, mostly the, the late 1950s, mid 1950s, who were, bringing up this technology completely from scratch. I mean, they were inventing all of these techniques as they went along. There was a certain amount of material that they were building on, but an awful lot of it had to be specially developed for the use of this new tool, which was the electron microscope. So as it turns out, we're going to start with an unusual collection of people. By saying that, what I mean is this is a set of three people who I think never came to the same scientific meeting or might have once or twice, but by and large, we're really working at very, very different kinds of levels of interest. Keith Porter is a man you'll hear about much later, like next lecture, who is one of the true founders of the field of cell biology. And he was a generative force for an awful lot of work that followed. Friedrich Schustrand, on the other hand, sort of had his own corner of work, and it appeared as if he never, he didn't really relate very well to the group that was the main cell biology group, which was Keith Porter's. There's some references here and there to disagreements about various things. And, when initially the, the group at, under Keith Porter was formed primarily at both Harvard and then eventually at the Rockefeller Institute. Schirstrand spent a little bit of time with them. He actually did some work at, at MIT, but then had some disagreements and he, had mo he moved out to UCLA in, in California. And the distance at that time in the 1950s was really significant. So he, he ended up working pretty much on his, in his own area and with a certain kind of challenge to the others. Andrew Huxley, you will recognize the name if, if you remember from cell structure, I talked about the muscle work done by a man named Hugh Huxley who has nothing to do with Andrew. And this is sort of an old joke, but Andrew Huxley comes from the family of Thomas Huxley, who was the original, one of the original supporters of Darwin and a very significant figure in biological history. That entire family has had many, many interesting members that have been involved throughout, throughout the last century. And it turns out you will know Huxley's name because he was the man who received the Nobel Prize for working with Hodgkin to develop the Hodgkin-Huxley model of nerve conduction. So it's, it's a kind of a peculiar mixture. Well, so why is it that I have all of them together? Well, as it turns out, each of them made a contribution as designing one of these microtones that is useful for looking at biological material. And the microtones differ quite a bit. So I thought that this would be an interesting opportunity to take these three people 
put them together in a way that they normally wouldn't be, but show you that they had this shared interest in microtomy and specifically microtomes for the electron microscope. So now I'm going to have to sort of go through a bunch of the procedures that you probably have heard of, but I just want to get us all back onto the same page for how one prepares material for the electron microscope. And as I indicated last time, it's really very hard to get a sense of perspective of how small the objects are that one is looking at. By the end of this lecture, I'll, I'll show you some segments of a, uh, of a video that is actually pretty good at showing you a lot of this. But for the moment, I just want to give you some background. And so the background is that tissues that are prepared for electron microscopy are fixed as they were for conventional light microscopy and still are, but are also fixed for uh, electron microscope studies. The initial studies used the materials that we used for light microscopes. So they used formaldehyde as a fixative. And then they discovered that formaldehyde didn't preserve tissue that well when you started looking at the deep level that you can with the electron microscope. Part of the reason is that chemically, you may recall, formaldehyde is a very simple molecule. It's, um, it basically is a, has a single carboxyl group and a couple of aminos and has the interesting property of not reacting with other tissues. It was never clear exactly why formaldehyde works as a fixative. Glutaraldehyde, on the other hand, has two binding sites and was very clearly possible to use for cross-linking of tissues. And so a number of laboratories went to a kind of a mixture of both formaldehyde, because it was a small molecule diffused in quickly, and glutaraldehyde, which then cross-linked the proteins. It binds through the uh, carboxyl group, <clears throat> binds to amino groups, not carboxyl, through the car carbonyl group, and binds to amino groups in the proteins. At the same time, you may recall that we talked a little bit about how Cajal and Golgi and others were using not only the silver stain, which was the special treatment that they had, but also they fixed with osmium tetroxide, because it turns out that osmium had a specific affinity for lipids, and so it would bind lipid materials quite well. Since osmium is electron dense, it also would be something that you could see in the electron microscope. So there was this combination of osmium tetroxide. And then it was also discovered that potassium permanganate could also fix membrane structures in a very significant way. So those became the fixation materials for preserving most tissues for electron microscopes. But then, it had to be put into some substance that would allow it to be eventually hard enough to section. And that was this collection of plastics, the first of which was methacrylate, and the other methacryl is the same stuff that plexiglass is made of. It's an acrylate. And the epoxies, which we now know of in terms of, mostly in terms of adhesives, but in fact, could be polymerized into a very strong and very stable polymer. The end result of that was a structure that ends up looking like this. You end up with a structure that is, oh, I don't know, a half a centimeter in diameter and about a centimeter long, which was called a, a, a tissue block. And it is at the tip of this block here, that your sample would be placed. And so what was then necessary was to develop a way of cutting that small sample 
very, very, into very thin sections. And these are sections one would like to have 50 microns thick or even less, actually quite a bit less if possible. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So the next issue is what can you use to cut this stuff? And early on in the process, people used uh, razor blades or very sharp blades in a microtome. But at some point, they discovered that a piece of glass, and this is a broken piece, a sheet of glass could be broken into these kinds of diagonal pieces. So what you would do is you take, um, depending on the machine you used, but you would basically start with a sheet of glass like this. You break it into smaller strips. Then you take one of the strips You cut the strip into squares. So now you would have a square like this. I will try to draw it so you see it now as a three-dimensional thing. Okay, so this kind of, of strip or square of glass, about a couple of centimeters, of, uh, no less, a half a centimeter wide this dimension here, you would then score it across the middle and break it so that you would now end up with a piece of glass that looks like this, diagonal, sort of triangular piece of glass, which is what you see in this picture over here. And the way you break that, as it turns out, this edge that you end up with is what you end up with as a cutting edge. And so here's a, a diagram that came from one of these manuals about how to make a diamond a glass knife. And what you would do is take this square, break it into a triangle, and then put a piece of tape around the corner of this thing. So it goes sort of like this. It's impossible to draw. And form a little container up above. And this container, which is now referred to as a boat sometimes, they don't have it listed here, but a boat, because instead of a boat which has, which sits in the water, this is a boat that contains water. And you would fill it with water. You'll see why in a minute. This was the glass knife that is still being used quite a bit because you can make a fresh glass knife anytime. They're easy to make. And the broken edge is sharp immediately and stays sharp. On the other hand, if you have a lot of money and are less interested in the sort of immediate sharpness of a glass knife, a number of companies came out with knives that were made out of diamond crystals, diamond chips. And so what you can see here is a little piece of diamond glued into a mount. And then this entire mount is used with, as you see here, a very large chamber to be filled with water. This, this image that I have over here now shows you a block, a block of tissue being held in a machine, which we'll talk about in a moment, that passes it through a knife. And for some reason in this picture, you really can't see the knife very clearly. So let me get rid of my circle. So now I can show you the knife, which is here here and they have a piece of plastic sitting on here to form a boat a boat this piece of plastic again is kind of like that that is to say it's filled with water and so the idea of this machine then is to pass the plastic sample across the knife edge and as it does to cut a small sample 
of it. And we'll get through some very nice examples of that in, the, in a few minutes. But first I thought I ought to talk to you a little bit about the microtomes themselves, because this was a preoccupation of a number of, of people. They started in most cases with a microtome that is actually available for cutting paraffin sections. It's a famous micro, microtome called the Spencer Model 820. Its origin is a little peculiar. Spencer, I think, was, was an, Ameri uh, an English company originally, but then it was taken over by American Optical. And so now there is something called the AO Spencer that is now found in almost all histology labs. Okay, and here's, here's what they look like. They actually haven't changed their shape. Uh, their basic mechanism in what seems like a hundred years. They're basically doing, they're always functioning in the same way. And the thing that made this particularly interesting was that instead of the kind of microtome, you may remember the microtome we showed you that Hiss had developed, right? A single slice at a time, or maybe a couple. What was done here was to put in a system in which you could turn a crank, this crank over here, and make the sample go up and down. Okay, as you rotate this crank in a circle, the sample would go up and down past the knife edge. And each time it did, it would be moved a little bit further forward. And so you'll notice that the knife that was in here is a steel knife. This thing is actually a sharpened piece of steel. So this is what people were using as a model. There's one part of this mechanism that is very interesting in terms of how to solve these issues, of how to make a system work. And what is done is that every time this wheel turns, the sample goes up and down, but not only that, it also pokes at a, a gear that you can't quite see over here. That gear turns a screw. And of course, the screw is hiding underneath here. Here's where the screw is. Okay, so this is supposed to be a screw. If you find these details, boring or confusing. I apologize, but as I said at the beginning of this course, this course is sort of an indulgence for me. So I'm just taking whatever pleasure I can in going through these things. Okay, so as this screw turns, because it turns every time you cut a, you rotate the sample up and down, move the sample, this screw turns a little bit. The screw moves this pointer. And it's not a pointer, it's, it's sort of a pin that sits on, uh, on this platform or this sheet of metal over here. And it moves back and forth. But it only moves a small amount because what makes it move is the uh, turning of this screw. So every time this screw turns, this piece moves a little bit. And because it's pushing against an inclined plane here, piece of metal this way, this piece of metal is now connected to the sample. And so what happens is, it's like, a, you know, following the steps of how we built the house that Jack built something. So you turn the crank. The crank raises the sample up and then it brings it down past the knife. Then it brings it up again as you keep turning. As it brings it up, it pokes this gear that's sitting over here that you can't see that causes this screw to turn. As the screw turns, it moves this piece, this 
little pyramidal structure. It brings it off to the right a little bit. And as it moves to the right, it pushes this inclined plane over here to move the sample further forward. So that now it's going to be cut again by them when it goes past the knife. Is that, is that semi-clear? I hope it's clear enough. OK. So the idea, let's see if I can make a very simple-minded drawing of this. All right. So here's the knife sitting like this at an angle. Your sample then is brought down past the knife. And a piece of the sample is cut off. That's the section that you want. And now you bring this, in fact, with this microtome, what you do is you then bring it back up again. And when it gets back up again, then it's moved forward one more time by a little notch, it goes forward. And then it can cut another section because that is now moved forward and will hit the knife again at a different spot. So that's the basic idea of the dispenser microtome. I've put in this link from somebody who got really excited about finding one of these in a junkyard and basically rejuvenating the whole system. And he has a great deal of detail about all of the components and how it works. It's, it's wonderful to read just for the enthusiasm. So this was then modified by various people, specifically the three kinds, the three people I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, this was then modified to generate microtomes that could be used for electron microscope samples. So the first of these that I want to talk about is this machine that was developed in the laboratories and in the machine shop of the Rockefeller Institute in New York. This is Keith Porter sitting at the microtome. I'll give you a little more detail of the microtome in a minute. Looking through a dissecting microscope at a knife which you can't see. That's the machine that was eventually sold throughout the world as the most convenient microtome to use in the 1960s. This was the one one found everywhere. You turn the crank by hand to cut a section. But what he added to it that was very interesting was that the path that the section took, that the block face took, instead of simply going up and down, which is what happened in the Spencer microtome, it was clear that these distances that they were cutting were going to be too small, that if it simply went back up again, it would more or less catch on the knife. So what Porter introduced was this idea of what became a kind of a shifted opening. You can see it in this microtome here, probably more than any other, where the block itself sitting on that rod would go down here and then be shifted over to the side and then come up the other way. So that it would not, so that it would not have a chance to hit the knife more than once. So this was referred to as a single pass system. Well, in the very early models, and there's a picture of a very early model down um, here, the lower image here, you'll notice, maybe you'll notice, there's no uh, no mechanism in here. The only thing you can see is this rod. And if you were to turn it around, you'd see this little opening. So that the rod would move up and down, or up, over, up, and down, up, over, and up, and down. Um, but there's no obvious advanced mechanism. And it turns out what they used as an advanced mechanism was a light bulb. They would take one of these laboratory lamps, 
the sort of thing you now see sort of in brown material with a, a little incandescent bulb in it. It's supposed to be a bulb. And you would cut a section and then turn on the light for a second or two, let it heat up and move the section, move the block face forward. The, lot, the rod would expand thermally as a result of this. This was referred to as a thermal advance. And I have to say, as I, you probably understand, I was in a lab that used these things. I didn't use the thermal advance one. But when you'd walk into the lab, and somebody was cutting sections with a thermal advance thing, you'd see the light flash on and off periodically. But he actually had to work in a separate small room because any air currents, any flow of air would disturb the thermal effect on the sections. And so you'd get very uneven sections and you'd get a very angry person yelling at you for screwing things up. But the idea of simply turning on a little light to get it to move far enough was, was quite charming in its own way. Later on, meaning a couple of years later, Porter managed to change the design quite a bit to this instrument here. This is actually my own personal instrument, so it's a little scary to show. But the basic idea here, there were two components to it. One of them is that, again, you can't quite see it. This piece, there's a, a corner piece here that sticks down through a hole. At the bottom of that hole is a screw. So what I've done is I've transferred that idea across here. This blue box is the equivalent of that hole. And this piece then would move along this thing, which is a screw. And a very fine screw. So it's a very fine threaded screw. And yet, if it simply moved along there, it would move the system too far in advance each time it turned. So instead, what he's got, and this is Again, a little tricky to see. The upper part of this is mounted here. And then underneath it, the inner box that holds the rod has a separate pivot underneath, which is over here. Okay, So that what happens is this would move a lot. This would then move only a little bit. And as a result, the sample, which was over here, would move very small enough distance that you could get thin enough sections to look at with the electron microscope. So this was the, the Porter Bloom machine. And as I said, this model with the mechanical advance is what was eventually manufactured to be uh, this one, the one that we see Porter looking at. But while this was going on, both Schustrand and Huxley were developing their own ideas of how to make a perfect, if you will, perfect microtone. And we start by talking about the way the Schustrand machine worked, because I actually was in a lab at one point that had a very old Schustrand microtone. And we went, to, we went ahead and, and tried to make it work. It turned out to be very difficult. So there were a couple of interesting features to this. Nevertheless, I, what, what fascinates me is the way people have been thinking about how to optimize and how to make this sort of thing work. So Schurstrand was very much aware that one of the big issues was vibration. You had to minimize vibration in order to make the system work. Because small variations as you made cuts would, would vary the sections quite a bit. So his solution to that was to mount the sample. Here's 
when sample sets. To mount this sample in a very large wheel. And this wheel is actually a sort of a, a large bearing, which meant it had lots of little wheel, little balls in between the two. So I've tried to draw that here, but the, you can't see the little balls. But the idea is that this was filled in with balls or with a lot of oil, so that this inner circle could be turned very smoothly. And to make it move even more smoothly, he had it coupled to a motor, which you can see over here, an electric motor. On the machine that I saw, this was carried even to a greater extreme in which the microtome itself was mounted on a table and the motor was on the wall of the room. And there'd be this long cable that went to the rotor. I just can't get over this machine. Okay. You'll just have to put up with this enthusiasm, guys. Sorry. Meanwhile, the sample is held on a rod. Here's the rod. And at the back end of the rod is a coil of wire. The coil of wire is used to heat this rod and expand it as you cut. Okay. Let me clear away my scribbles for a second so that now you can see that the sample was then passing across a knife, and the knife is over here. So the idea is, and this was not supposed to look like Amazon, I'm sorry, that this whole sample would rotate. The sample itself is sitting eccentrically like this. Okay. And the result of it was that that sample would come past the knife edge and cut a section off and then swing out of the way and then come back down again and cut another section. So it's a single pass system, a little more complicated. In his paper, it says specifically We've adjusted this thing so that it cuts more or less 60 slices per minute, one every second, every second. So that you could imagine this thing cutting at more or less this range of cut, 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 cut. And as it turns out, that's actually much too fast. You'll see that what, what happens when you cut sections like that is they tend to crush up as you cut them. But it was, it was quite an experience to actually get this machine working and to see it functional. They really appear only in museums now. Some of the principles, the principle of thermal advance is now used in some of the more modern microtones, but not, not this circular mechanism for mounting. So in the middle of all this comes Andrew Huxley. Now, remember what Huxley is known for is his work on the propagation of nerve fiber, of nerve impulses. This is the Hodgkin Huxley work in which his main interest had to do with, opt with membrane behaviors. On the other hand, he was also very interested in muscle. And it gets a little complex because both Andrew and Hugh, who were not related to each other, both were interested in muscle, and both came up with that same model of a sliding filament as a structure for how muscle work. So this is this is a little sort of involves some personal untangling, but at any rate, Andrew Huxley wanted to be able to cut sections of muscle because although he was a physiologist, he was very interested and being able to visualize the structure of muscle. And so what he did was he looked at the design of the existing microtones and he said, you know, 
He liked the idea of mechanical advance, like the Porter system. But he was very concerned that bearings of one form or another, either this enormous thing that was in the Schirstrand model, or these little gearing systems that were in the Porter Bloom system, that a bearing represented an intersection in which metal was built, was sort of rubbing against metal. And that was a potential source of vibration during the, the cutting. So what he decided to do instead was wherever things were going to be flexing, wherever they were going to be moving with respect to each other, he put in a spring, a little sheet spring. So these would be little pieces of metal that look like this. And there'd be a screw at one end and a screw at the other. And you would bolt them to these two pieces of metal that you wanted to flex with respect to each other. And worked very well, except that in fact, every now and then those springs would break and you'd have to replace them. But as a concept, the idea was then you didn't have to worry about metal moving on top of metal on top of bearings of that sort. So that was one of the contributions he made. The other is impossible to see in this diagram. This is from his original paper, so it's not very helpful. But what he did was he said, let's have, instead of moving the sample by hand, which was what was on the Porter Bloom machine, where you'd move the sample by cranking something, that what he would like to do is take the sample, put it on, a, let's put a handle on the sample in some way. You grab the handle, you pull it up, and then you let it fall through what was described in his papers as a dash pot of oil. What that meant is it was a little bit like a, a, a shock absorber in a car where this would be filled with oil, but it'd be possible for this to slowly move down in the oil like that without anybody pushing it or holding it. So it would move again very smoothly through the sample. Then you'd pick it up again, cut another section and let that one fall. Okay. Eventually the company that a company took this over. It was originally developed at Cambridge University and there's a Cambridge company that built them. But then it was taken over by a, a Swedish company called LKB. Okay. So it became the LKB microtone. They also made another microtome, which was, was actually a thermal advanced type. And you'll see in a second, a little bit of an example of how that system worked. Okay, so this is what I wanted to cover in terms of these machines. I hope I didn't blow you away too much. But what I thought I would do is end up by showing you a little bit of a video that was made to illustrate how to do sections. And what you can see in this momentary frame, at this point, you see a knife, which you're already used to, a sample being held down. Let me change this. See the arrow. OK, sample moving here. And what we're looking at here is the edge of the glass knife. So this line here would be the, the knife itself. And what you're seeing is a section coming off and floating on the water. Okay, This will go by relatively fast. So I want to just point out one other thing about this. What you will see is that as sections come off, so here's a section that comes off, each section will then push the next section off as it comes off, okay, like this. Now, 
What you'll also see in this little bit of video is that what ends up being the first section that they show you has some color in it. it. Looks almost like a little bit of a rainbow. The others are sort of like this. They're somewhat silvery. And the reason that this is so is that the thickness of the section that is being cut is so thin that what you see is an interference fringe of color that comes off that section. This was actually worked out by a guy named Lee Peachy. Wonderful name, wonderful guy. But here's the idea, that if you have a section like this, now I'm afraid I'm gonna throw a little bit of optics at you, and a wave of light comes into it from an angle, The light is reflected off this upper surface, but it's also reflected off the lower surface. Okay. And these two rays of light from the upper surface and the lower surface interfere with each other. The way that they interfere is a function of this distance. That is something about the distance between the top and the bottom, which will be something having to do with the wavelengths of light. Ah, so that what happens is you can eliminate most of the wavelengths because they won't reinforce, but some of them will. This is what you see, by the way, of a drop of oil or a little bit of oil on a puddle. When you, you know, especially when the cars have driven over the puddles, and there's a little bit of oil on them, and you see a little sheen of color. It's that kind of thickness that these sections are when they're cut. So, Well, there you are. Right over here is a thick section. When there's, when there's a lot of color, it's too thick. So this was the first thing that was cut, followed then by a series of really lovely sections. That's as much as I wanted to tell you about the microtones. In the, in the next session, then I want to start talking some more about how the field of cell biology was formed with some of the early experiments that both Keith Porter and George Pilati and Sikovitz, Phil Sikovitz, put together in the early and mid 19, well, I guess 1950s into the 1960s, in which this field of cell biology really emerged and how they used the electron microscope to reveal great deals of information about cell structure.